Now, we come to Daniel 9, the final chapter that we're going to look at. And Daniel 9 consists of two parts. There's a prayer, and then there's the appearance of an angel, or a supernatural revelation, as it were. So first, there's a prayer, okay? Now, if you'll read Daniel's prayer, this is a crucial point. You'll see nowhere in the prayer does Daniel at any time seek for an explanation about anything. He understands why everything has happened. Not one time does he say, Lord, why this? Lord, why did all these things happen? He knows why, and he says so repeatedly in his prayer. His prayer is not a prayer for any kind of explanation of anything at all. Okay? So, the last time, as I said, the last time we see Daniel needing an explanation was about the vision of the 2300 evening and mornings. Don't miss this point, okay? Anyway, Daniel prays and he offers his prayer, confessing his sins and the sins of Israel. Then what happened next? Daniel 9, 20 through 22. Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, and he said, O oh, Daniel, I've now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. He, Gabriel comes to give, give him skill and understanding? Skill and understanding about what? Well, as we said, what was the last thing that, according to the text, he didn't understand? As I've been saying and explaining all along, the last thing he didn't understand was the prophecy of the 2300 days. In fact, the Hebrew word for understand in Daniel 8, 27, when Daniel says he didn't understand the vision of the 2300 days, is the same root word used in Daniel 9, 22, when Gabriel comes and says he's come to give him skill and understanding. Thus, we have a strong linguistic link here right from the start. Also, notice, too, who has come to give Daniel skill and understanding. Who was it? It was the angel Gabriel. When was the last time Gabriel appeared? If you read Daniel 8, you'll know that after Daniel was given the vision in the first 14 verses, the angel Gabriel is told to make Daniel understand it. Here's Gabriel in Daniel 8. And I heard a voice between the banks of the Uli, and he said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. Thus, the same angel whom we saw in Daniel 8, in the context of explaining to Daniel the meaning of what he's seen, now comes to Daniel again and tells him he's come to give him skill and understanding. Skill and understanding about what? Well, Gabriel tells him. Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel had seen at the beginning, he goes on and on, and he says, O oh, Daniel, I've now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. What vision? Well, the last vision that Daniel did understand, the last vision that Daniel had and which he did understand, as we said, is the vision about the 2300 evening and mornings of Daniel 8.14. Remember, Daniel 8 ended with him saying specifically that he didn't understand the vision about the evening and mornings, the cleansing of the sanctuary. How much clearer could it be? He has come to explain to Daniel the 2300 days. In fact, there's more. Look with me at Daniel 8, 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, and I saw the vision, and I saw in vision. Three times you got the word vision there, and it's using the Hebrew word there, hazom. We're just going to use a little bit of Hebrew here. Now, notice the words for vision, hazom. Daniel then describes what he saw in the vision. He uses this word. He describes the ram, the goat, the little horn, and so forth. So the point is, the, word, the Hebrew word for vision here, hazon, refers to the whole vision of Daniel 8. However, let's go back, let's look at Daniel 8, 26 and 27, when Daniel talks specifically about the, the vision of the evening and morning. What do the texts say? And the vision of the evening and morning, which was told is true, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. Notice, we've got two different words here. We have, even though it's translated vision, the word for vision, hazon, refers to the whole vision in Daniel 8. We saw that already. In contrast, 
The word Mari is used specifically in reference to the vision of the evening and mornings, the part that he didn't understand, the very part that Gabriel comes to give him understanding about. So Chazon is for the whole vision of Daniel 8, Mare specifically for the vision regarding the 2300 evenings of Daniel 8.14. Now, let's look at what Gabriel says to Daniel in chapter 9. So we got Gabriel, the same angel interpreter appears to him in Daniel 8, appears to him again, and he specifically tells him he's come to give him skill and understanding. And as we said, the last thing that he did not understand was the vision, the mare of the evening of the 2300 evening and mornings, okay? What does Daniel say to him? What does Gabriel say to him? Here's the text again. Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I'd seen in the vision at the beginning, so he's pointing back to Gabriel. Oh, Daniel, I've now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the mare. Mare? What mare? What vision? The vision, the mare of the 2300 evening and mornings that he specifically said he did not understand. Okay? Thus, we have the same angel interpreter as Daniel 8 who comes to give Daniel understanding, and the last thing he didn't understand was the mare of Daniel 8.14. How much clearer could it be that in Daniel 9, Gabriel is coming to give him understanding about the mare, the vision of Daniel 8, 14, that he didn't understand. Now also, think about this too. What kind of vision was the mare of Daniel 8, 14? Remember, it was a time prophecy unto 2,300 evening and mornings. Time prophecy. What is the next thing that Gabriel says to Daniel after he tells, he's, he tells him to understand the mare, the time prophecy of Daniel 8, 14? What does he say? He says, and at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I've come to show ye. Understand the matter and consider the mare, pointing right back to Daniel 8, 14. Then what does he say? Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. Seventy weeks. What kind of prophecy of that? Of course, it's a time prophecy as well. It's clear. Gabriel has come to give Daniel an explanation for the 2300-day prophecy of Daniel 8, 14. Now, folks, there are a lot more links exist, and they're going to be on our website. <clears throat> the point is, is that the time prophecy of Daniel 8, 14, and the time prophecy of Daniel 9, 24 through 27 are linked. I mean, please, Adventists aren't the only ones to see this, too. In fact, I have. I have in my office an Orthodox Jewish commentary on Daniel. And I was wondering, what do these Orthodox Jews do with the 70-week prophecy of Daniel 9, 24 through 27? And the fascinating thing is the first thing it does is it links it back to the mare of Daniel 8, 14. In other words, they do the exact same thing linking it as we do. I hope to put that page up on this website. Anyway, from this Orthodox commentary. Anyway, so where are we now? Where are we at this point? We've seen, let's see where we've come so far. We've seen that the judgment of Daniel 7 is the same thing as the cleansing of the sanctuary in Daniel 8, and it happened sometimes after 1798, but before the second coming. Then we've seen that the mare of Daniel 8.14, the vision about the cleansing of the sanctuary, was the only part of Daniel 8 not explained. Then in Daniel 9, the next chapter, the same angel that appeared to him in Daniel 8, who told him to explain the vision to him, reappears, and he says he's come to give Daniel skill and understanding. And the last thing Daniel did not understand was the mare, the vision of the 2300 days. Gabriel then specifically says to Daniel to consider the mare, the vision. What mare? Obviously, the mare of Daniel 8, 14. So where are we now? We have two time prophecies, right? We've got the 2300 days of Daniel 8, 14, and now the 70-week prophecy of Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Two time prophecies that are clearly linked. Thus, we can see that the explanation comes in Daniel 9. The 70-week prophecy is the explanation for the part of Daniel 8 that wasn't explained, the 2300-day prophecy. So where are we now? We have two time prophecies, the 2300 days of Daniel 8, 14, and the 70-week prophecy of Daniel 9, 24 through 27, two time prophecies that are clearly linked. 
Okay, so look at this. What do we have here? We have two time prophecies here now. The 2300 days, years, and the 70 weeks are 490 years. Now, wait a minute. Daniel 8, 14 talked about 2300 days, evening and mornings. I have up here years. Why do I do that? You know, we talked earlier about the day-year principle and how many and how and, and many time prophecies a day equals a year. Well, it needs to be applied here as well. Folks, there are many reasons why, which I don't want to get into now. The website will deal with this topic in much more detail. Though I want to give you two reasons right away, just to help establish you now. First, Daniel 8 comes in symbols. We saw a ram, goat, and a little horn. Okay, they're, they're, they're symbols. They're not to be taken literally. They're realities. They're, they're symbols for other realities. So why take the time prophecy as a literal, literal element as well? We shouldn't. The symbolic nature of the vision itself reveals that the time element is symbolic, not literal as well. Hence, we're dealing with prophetic time. We use the day-year principle as well. Second, and this is important too, the vision itself in Daniel 8 started out with Medo-Persia many centuries before Christ, and goes through Greece, Rome, pagan and papal, into, into the future, even from our time, okay? Now, a literal, a literal 2,300 days is less than seven years. Now, think about this. How could the vision, which covers such a long span of history, climax with the time prophecy that covers less than seven years? It really doesn't make sense. Apply the day-year principle, and suddenly, instead of seven years, it turns into 2,300 years, a vast span of time that fits so much better the range and scope of the prophecy than does a mere seven years itself. In fact, it's interesting. One ancient Jewish commentator even translated Daniel 8.14 with the word, Word years, not days, because it was obvious to him that what's meant. It's the same here with the 70 weeks. I have 490 years. Why do I do that? Well, for starters, 70 weeks is 490 days. Seven weeks, seven days a week, so 70 times 7, it's 490. Thus, thus with the day-year principle, it becomes 490 years. And please, folks, Adventists are hardly the only ones here to have applied the day-year principle to this prophecy. It has to be applied here as well. In fact, the prophecy makes no sense without it. And let me show you why. And to do this, I want to get into the last time prophecy that we're going to look at. I don't, spend too much, I don't intend to spend much time on the details of this prophecy. We'll have more on the website. Instead, I want to focus on just the points that are important to us here, our immediate concern. And they're just two points the starting date of the 70-week prophecy, and to whom it points, okay? It's known as the 70-week prophecy of Daniel 9, 24 through 27, though I'm going to focus on verse 25 for now. You know, there's plenty of good information on this, and we're going to put more on the website, so don't worry about all the details. But now remember, in Daniel 9, 24, he gives him the 70-week prophecy, okay? 70 weeks are determined. Then in the next verse, he gives him more information. What does he say? Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. Okay, so what do we got? First, in verse 24, the 70-week prophecy. But what comes next? It gives a time frame that will reach until the Messiah, the Prince. The Messiah, the Prince... Who is the Messiah, the Prince? Of course, Jesus of Nazareth. Again, folks, this is hardly an SDA interpretation that Christians all through the ages have seen this as Jesus. Now, the Messiah, the Prince Jesus, we know lived in an early part of what we call A.D., Latin for the year of our Lord. What Lord is that? Of course, the Lord Jesus. And this is a fact that helps us understand this general time frame here, which is the early decades of what is known as the first century A.D. So what do we have? We have the Messiah, the Prince Jesus, who lived in the first century A.D. Okay, it's pointing to the Messiah, the Prince. Now, the other thing we want to look at is the time prophecy itself, which, as we can see here, begins with the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, who was Jesus. And it will be from this command and restore Jerusalem 
unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, or 69 weeks. So what do we have? Can you see a problem here? If you take the 69 weeks of the 70-week prophecy literally, while Jesus was alive, Jerusalem was not destroyed, nor was it destroyed any time right before his earthly ministry. Yet, if taken literally, we have to believe that about one year and four months before the ministry of Jesus, Jerusalem had been in ruins and a command had been given to rebuild it. That makes no sense at all. However, all you have to do, as in the other prophecy, time prophecy in Daniel 7, is apply the day year principle here. If so, we have two time elements, the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem and Jesus the Messiah. We have them separated by exactly 483 years, 69 of the 70 weeks. You do the math yourself, which as we'll see quickly fits history so much better than does the, lud than does the ludicrous notion that only one year and four months separates the command to rebuild Jerusalem and Jesus the Messiah. Plus two, as we've seen, the 2300-day prophecy and the 70-week prophecy are closely related. In fact, they're really two parts of the same prophecy. So Gabriel came to Daniel in chapter 9, and after pointing him back to the time prophecy of Daniel 8:14, he then gave him another time prophecy, the 70 weeks. Thus, if the first one, the 2300 days, needed the day-year principle, the only sensible thing is to apply it to the other time prophecy as well. We've got the 2300-year prophecy and the 70 weeks or the 490-year prophecy. The 2300 days, the 70 weeks we have in both. First, it says that 70 weeks are determined. That's more the, 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 the Hebrew. But the literal Hebrew, that's how it's translated. But the riddle of Hebrew word for determined is really cut off, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Thus, the 70 weeks, as we could see, are cut off. The 70 weeks or the 490 years are cut off. Cut off from what? Well, obviously, from the larger time prophecy, the 2300 years. Hence, we can see more evidence about how closely related these two prophecies are. The 70 weeks is just a smaller part of the larger 2300-day prophecy. And because the 2300-day needs the day-year principle, the 70 weeks does as well. Plus, think about this too. How can you cut off 490 years from what is only 2300 days, which if taken literally is six years and four months? You can't. It makes no sense if taken literally. Hence, as long as you see the need for the day-year principle in Daniel 9, 24 through 27, which you need to reach Jesus, then you have powerful evidence why you need the day-year principle for the 2300 prophecy as well. Anyway, it says that 70 weeks or 490 years are cut off from the 2300-year prophecy. But when does the prophecy begin? Well, we are immediately told. What does it say? Daniel 9, 25. Know therefore and understand that from the command going forth to build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be six weeks and 62 weeks. From the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, shall be 69 weeks. Thus, right off the bat, 69 of the 70 weeks are accounted for. If we apply the day-year principle as we must, 483 of the 490 years are covered here. Now, the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, Daniel wrote after the ancient city had been destroyed by the Babylonians, can be accurately dated to the year 457 B.C. That was a date, by the way, that Isaac Newton used for this prophecy. The irony is this is really one of the more solid historical dates we have. You know, it was kind of funny. I once read an article by somebody contesting this date. He gave all the arguments against 457, goes on and on and on. And what does he conclude? He concludes that the date is not 457, but 458. Okay, that's, that's, that's all he could come up with. And if you really get into it, you'll see that it's really only a difference of six months. That's it. We'll deal with this question on the website in more detail. But almost in more, most cases, if you look up this date, you will come to, at worst, 458 instead of 457. But the evidence is really strong for 458. Thus, 457. Thus, this is what we have so far. See what we've got here. Thus, the prophecy states that from the restore and rebuild Jerusalem, 457 B.C., unto the Messiah, the Prince, will be, Jesus, 
will be 483 years. And as we said, the Messiah, the Prince, is Jesus. So it's no coincidence then that if you go from 457 B.C. and add 483 years, you come to 27 A.D. You've got to remember, allow for the conversion from B.C. to A.D., which adds one year. So thus, instead of 26, which you would get if you simply subtracted 457 from 483, from 483, the date comes out to 27 A.D. And our best records show that John the Baptist baptized Jesus in the Jordan River in 27 A.D. That's when Jesus began his ministry. So what do we have? What have we got so far here? We've got 483 of the 490 years, 69 of the 70 weeks, 457 B.C. to A.D. 27. The fact that this points to Jesus is more proof of the day-year principle because, again, if we were dealing with literal time, a mere 69 weeks, the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem wouldn't, wouldn't get us anywhere near the known dates of Jesus, which is the first century A.D. With the day-year principle, that problem is solved. We believe that Jesus was baptized in A.D. 27. So what do we have here, though? What we have here, though, is 69 of the 70 weeks, or 483 of the 490 years taken. If we come to the full 490 years, this is what we get. We get this. 490 years, 457 B.C. to 34 A.D. The last week, or the last seven years, will bring you to 34 A.D., now, there are a couple other very important dates in the prophecy, but I don't want to get into here. I, they're not necessary for us right now. I want to instead to focus really only on the starting date of the 70-week prophecy because that's all we really need for what we want to do now. The website itself will get into more details about the 70-week prophecy. But as you can see, if you go from 457 B.C. and add 490 years, remember the zero-year modification, you get A.D. 34 at the end of the 70-week prophecy. Now, don't miss this crucial point. What is the foundation of this prophecy? The 70-week and the 2300-day prophecy? For, again, they're really the same prophecy. Instead of saying, what is the foundation? I should say, who is the foundation? And that is Jesus. The 70-week prophecy rests upon the dates of Jesus. If you want to debate the starting date of the, of, of the, four, of the, of the 70 week prophecy, you can't go too far off because if you did, you would come up with dates that were really not linked to the dates of Jesus. The point is the life of Jesus gives us the assurance that the basic time frame of the prophecy is correct. That's a good foundation, is it not? Whew. Though there's so much more in this prophecy that could be explored, for our immediate purposes, there are two crucial points. First, the 490-year prophecy is cut off from the larger 2300-day prophecy. Second, the starting point of the 490 years, and hence the 2300 years, which was not a given, we were not given a starting point in Daniel 8, is 457 B.C. So look what we have here. 490 years, 457 B.C. to 34 A.D. and 2300 years. The 490-year prophecy is cut off from the larger prophecy, the 2300-day years of Daniel 8, 14. Now, the whole idea of being cut off implies what? That they're two parts of the same thing. As I said, this is really one prophecy, but in two parts. Otherwise, the idea of cutting off makes no sense. You don't cut off five meters of a pipe that is not already part of a larger pipe. Thus, when we cut off the 490-year prophecy from the 2300 years, what do we get? You got 2300 minus 457. You come to 1843. I mean, you cut off or subtract because isn't cutting off the same as subtracting? 457 from 2300, you get 480, 1843. But what about 1844? Again, we're not dealing with the number line. We are dealing with the calendar, so you don't have the zero year. So you put those numbers on the calendar, regarding them as years, and starting with 457 B.C. and going 2,300 years, what do you get? What do you get? 457 B.C., remembering 1 B.C., 1 A.D., 2,300 years, 1844. What do you know? 1844. Now, folks, there were a lot of Bible students just before that time doing pretty much what we have done here who expect something to happen in the mid-1840s. It wasn't just the Millerites. 
Look at this again. Notice with me a couple of things. First, the time frame 1844, it covers all the empires that we have talked about. As we saw, by the time of this prophecy, Babylon was pretty much out of the picture. The time frame, however, takes us through Medo-Persia, it takes us through Greece, it takes us through Rome, pagan and papal Rome, past the 1798 phase, right up through to where we are to 1844. It covers all of that. So a review of where we have been so far. Okay, we've got Babylon, okay, we're going to do them all. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan and papal Rome, 1798, the judgment in heaven, which is this cleansing of the saints for 1844, God's eternal kingdom. And remember what we saw earlier? The judgment in Daniel 7 showed that it had to come after 1798 and before the second coming. And what do you know? 1844 pits, fits perfectly. The 2300 years of Daniel 814 reaches to the year 1844, the longest time prophecy in the Bible, a prophecy built on the foundation of Jesus, one that brings us from antiquity, quote, into the modern era. Look at this. At this point, folks, this chart pretty much says it all. Again, the par look at the parallel, the sequence of kingdoms. Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, God's eternal kingdom. That shows that the judgment seen in Daniel 7 and the cleansing of the sanctuary are the same event, and it occurs after 1798, but before God's eternal kingdom. This alone takes you 95% of the way there. You just need Daniel 9 to narrow it down to a specific year. Hence, the beginning of the cleansing of the sanctuary is the year 1844. That's when the judgment begins, so powerfully depicted in Daniel 7 like this. Look at this. And judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. 